the, the steps that you can take to survive the experience of this uh, epidemic or pandemic crisis. I've invited a few people to join us today. Um, with us first will be Peter Schreier. Uh, Peter is uh, the, the general partner of the law firm Cooley and Schreier in Springfield, Mass, and has been my personal attorney, quite frankly, for almost 30 years, um, and is a very knowledgeable business and transactional attorney. So I'm gonna ask him some specific questions about what the circumstances create for you from a legal perspective, what things you can do to protect your business now and be thoughtful about preparing for what might be coming. We'll take questions. I can't guarantee you we'll answer all of them, but if you have questions um, in, in the YouTube chat, um, if you're watching us in the chat, you'll be able to add your questions there and we are absolutely happy to take them and we'll do our best to answer those that we think are appropriate for the group to hear. Um, the second guest we have is George Kane. He runs the largest direct TV dealership in the country out of California, National Satellite Center. Is that, is that right, George, National Satellite Center? That's, that's yeah, my I, Pacific Concepts is the corporation. That's the email address I'll issue for people that need help later. And DBA is National Satellite, correct? So George's team um, sells direct TV commercially to restaurants, bars, and public viewing spaces. And we're gonna talk about your programming because especially for our sports themed operators, such a big chunk of how you market and make money, we wanna make sure you have some good guidance on how to respond to direct TV now that we're sort of a week into this, we know there are gonna be some things you're gonna to have to manage. And then finally, we'll take questions for about a half an hour, 40 minutes, I will, but I'm gonna outline some ideas about how you should move forward, um, you know, and some of the, the parameters and some of the news and just, you know, kind of have a, a commiseration and then hopefully you guys will have some questions about your, your individual situations and I'll offer whatever insight I can provide as a 25 year veteran and successful restaurant operator to the mix. And, you know, even if it's just a discussion that we have. So, um, you know, and we may come out of this with more questions than we have answers and we will do a follow up um, email that will review any of the questions that we didn't answer successfully to give you a chance to hear about that sometime early next week. So that's the point. So I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna start uh, by, again, thanking Peter and George for joining us. And I'm gonna specifically start with Peter. Um, and, and I guess the, you and I spoke the other day and the term you used that was really the most powerful to me was force majeure. And if you could take a minute and sort of describe what that means to a restaurant owner or a business owner and help us to understand what that's gonna mean in the grand scheme of whatever we deal with over the next six months. Thank you. So um, force majeure, for those who have not heard of the term, is a, um, a, a French term that's found in most, if not all, contracts. Um, and what it does is it normally, um, um, people think of it as, oh, there's an act of God. So there was an act of God here, so I can get out of the contract. And that is really oversimplifying it. Um, the concept behind force majeure is that there are certain circumstances where in a contract, we may want somebody to come out, right, get out of it. For, for example, um, I'm renting your house on, on, in Long Beach. I'm renting your house and I'm gonna come for a long weekend and a tornado takes it away and the house isn't there. Do I get my deposit back? So force majeure would say, well, there's, been, there's an impossibility or a frustration, uh, not, a, not a frustration, impossibility or impracticality, can't use it. That house doesn't exist anymore. I should be able to get out of that contract, give me my money back. Um, a few states, very few, have codified it in their laws and already have this as part of their law, not many. So what most people do, in a lot of the European countries, this is part of their civil codes. Uh, in this country, it's up to um, contract law. So what you do is you've got to draft a, a, a contract that says, in these certain events, I can either extend the time period for which I have to perform, or I might even be able to terminate it. So a lot of people, when this all started, um, um, uh, a lot of tenants started looking at leases, saying, wow, do I have a force majeure clause? Can I possibly delay paying rent? Um, you don't have it in your promissory note or your financial obligations because banks wouldn't give it to you. Normally, force majeure excludes um, payment obligations. Um, you sometimes see them in, in purchase contracts. Let's say you're buying a, a whole bundle of um, liquor and, um, 
you don't need it. You know, you're going to be cutting down your purchases, but you agreed to a, 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 a price uh, a while ago and you got a better buy on it. And now you're thinking, well, geez, I'd really like to delay that purchase. You look at the contract and see, does force majeure cover it? And it may. Um, this is, is something, um, this is really the prime example of force majeure. However, it's really important to see how the force majeure clause is written. Some people write them uh, in the event that there is an act of God, windstorm, hailstorm, snowstorm, or the like, I can, you know, the parties can extend the contract. Well, that's, that's probably the most basic form of force majeure clause. Likely wouldn't cover um, this kind of a uh, pandemic. Um, very few people think about putting pandemics in, although in the last three days, you know, you can imagine that on the internet with all the lawyers talking, you know, everybody's rewriting their force majeure clauses now to include um, pandemic. So and, let me interrupt you. So, yeah. um, so force majeure, so, so, so let a listener right now might be interested in going back to their lease as an example in reading through their lease and seeing if there's a clause that specifically covers force majeure. Is that yes. a fair thing to say? Absolutely. It should be doing Right. Yes. So that's the first step. Doing it, you should be first thing you do is pull out your lease, pull out any contractual obligation yes. where you may get squeezed right now, right. Um, and and look at it. Now, it, normally you find them at the end where they put in the what, what people refer to as the boilerplate, and this is going to be a great example as to why people um, can't just assume boilerplate is just boilerplate, because they're going to look at these force majeure clauses now, and it may give them some relief. It also may not give them some relief because m most people don't pay attention to it. You know, if you do business in Oklahoma, you probably are worried about hailstorms and tornadoes. Um, but as far as a pandemic goes, people haven't really thought of it. Um, so you got to first first step is pull out the um, uh, pull out the lease and take a look at it. And if it says, you know, first see how broad it's written and see if you want to pull the trigger and what you have a right to pull. The trigger may be, we can delay, we can extend payment. It's probably not, you can terminate. But then again, you've also got to, again, read the whole thing because many people say that a force majeure event does not, it, it's good for anything for performance except for payment. So a monetary obligation is oftentimes excluded. Um, so you got to look at that in your lease. All right, so let's talk about business interruption insurance because many of our, you know, our listeners definitely have it. I think you, when you and I talked, one of the things you said is force majeure is, is obviously a part of that, but there might literally be exceptions for pandemics. Correct. So, well, business, so business interruption insurance, um, most people, and if there's any insurance agents on the phone, I'm not picking on them, or if any of your family members are insurance agents. Um, <laughs> Um, business interruption insurance, people are going to have an enormous surprise. Um, it's, that is turning out to be really a, a, um, a disaster. No, no um, you know, uh, pun intended, but it's really becoming very bad because what people are finding is business interruption insurance generally doesn't cover pandemics. It did, I'm told, up until I think it was 2011 when we had either swine flu or bird flu. Um, and, and SARS and what happened in mirrors. And what happened is the insurance companies after that, I believe it was Taj Hotels collected like $16 million um, because of a downturn in business. And after that, the insurance companies rewrote all the policies um, saying that pandemic is excluded. That's gonna be a, a real kick in the ass and um, is gonna be a problem. I question whether, and I discussed this with another client today, um, whether there's any exposure to insurance agents who didn't tell their customers that, hey, um, you know, we're renewing your insurance now. Understand your business interruption insurance no longer covers pandemic. And if you want it covered, you can buy extra coverage with a rider. Oh, wow. So I don't know where that's going to go. We were just kicking it around today. Um, it's, it's quite possible that they'll be, you know, my guess is after the dust settles, um, which as you said earlier is, is months from now, but after the dust settles, there'll be lawsuits because people are gonna say, well, geez, I paid business interruption insurance for all these years. Why am I now not covered when I expected to be covered? Why didn't you tell me? And then right. there's a the whole issue. 
you know, it's a separate legal issue, not for the purposes of this call, as to what duties insurance agents have, and those vary state by state. Um, there are some states that say that insurance agents don't have a duty um, to tell you about other, uh, other avenues of coverage. I think you have a pretty good, to me, I think it's a, a pretty fair argument that if I had it and it's been removed, that you have to tell me that it's been removed and what I can do to supplement it. All right, so that's a really important point is many of them, I'm sure many of the people who are listening or will watch this later are aware of the fact that they bought business interruption insurance and maybe they've bought it for 10 years. So they would have the ability to go back, look at their policies, and demonstrate that somebody didn't take the time to let them know about the removal of pandemics. Correct. And then it'd be an issue of state law as to whether you have an E&O claim, an errors and omissions claim against the insurance agent who would be insured for errors and omissions. I'm not looking to just dump on insurance agents, no, but to tell you what's up so you have coverage. Because this is, this is going to, to be devastating, devastating losses to the economy and to many of our small businesses. Yeah. I mean, there is no question that the tentacles of this, this is the part that I think most folks haven't really grasped yet. It's not what's getting canceled today. It's what, what's going to be canceled months from now as a result. So that the way this thing radiates out across our entire economy is incomprehensible. We're all sort of just in shock right now, which is why this kind of conversation is so valuable because we want to talk about the rational problems. So I'm going to use that as a chance to shift gears. And while I hate the idea of talking negatively about what the future looks like, I think our operators deserve to at least have a clue as to what some of the remedies are and what they might do if they find themselves defaulting and having difficulty keeping their business running. So let's talk about sort of, you know, either steps like renegotiating with the landlord. Um, Perfect topic, because we, that, that's frankly the last three days, that's really all I've been talking about here and working. So, great, give us some excellent, insight. Excellent topic. And for everybody who's listening, um, law, is, law varies state by state. And, and is really fact and circumstance dependent. So understand we're talking generally here, I can't be giving legal advice just across the internet. That being said, we're having a general discussion. These are things to think about. Um, so first thing, first, everybody should know that you, you generally bank with your lender. So if you have money in your bank account um, and you're not in default, generally the bank can't go and take your money. But if you go into default, the bank has a right to go into your account and take your money. It's called a right of set off. Um, that right exists probably in every state in the country and it's in most loan documents. So you need to know if you go to call your bank and say, hey, listen, I'm having a problem. You better have a really good um, sense of who your bank is because they're, they're, they're likely to go into your account. They do have the right to do this. I've seen this happen where they go into your account, scoop the whole account, and say, well, you're in default. You just told us you can't pay and take your money. And then you're really behind the eight ball. So you really got to talk to your local lawyer about that because you know you might also be obligated under your loan documents to keep your money in the bank. There are some people who want to remove a chunk of it before they have this kind of a conversation just to protect themselves and have a little bit of a war chest in case there's a problem. Now that's actually really solid advice. So again, if you if you have a bank note of some sort, or even if, as pertains to managing your relationship with your landlord, do everything you can to, to protect the money you have prior to that so that you're, nobody can come after you in, in ways that you don't have any kind of control over. Right, because we all have, most, most business have a revolving line of credit and generally revolving lines of credit are demand instruments, meaning a bank can demand it for any reason at all as long as it's not for a discriminatory reason. They can't say pay your loan because you're, you're black or Jewish or, or anything you know, like that or a woman but they can say, we just demanded it and they have a right to do that. So that's normally what they'll do is they'll say, well, we, we made demand and we pulled the money and paid off the line of credit or applied it to the line of credit. So you gotta right. know that going into this. That's that good. being said, generally the best rule is to talk to your creditors. And especially right now, the banks from what we're seeing, banks uh, and landlords are actually being pretty forgiving about working out a game plan with people at a, as to how to um, get through this. Um, and they may do, you know, they probably, um, they'll require you to pay interest each month, but they may modify your loan and let you go interest only for the next four or five months. You remember interest for the bank is rent for the money. They want to get their rent. Um, so a, a lot of them I think are going to go and give people four or five, six months interest only. 
and then start with uh, principal again. And and what you can do is you know seek a principal deferment, um, and just you know push it off six months, or take the you know the the, the six months you're going to take off, either put it at the end, or maybe amortize it over the balance of the uh, term of your loan. Right. But again, so you, you got to talk to your principal agreement, but not right. Yeah. Um, landlords, talk to your landlord. If you're, you know, if, if, if in your business, in some states, um, bars and restaurants are now closed. They had to. Um, restaurants can do to go. Uh, in Massachusetts, all bars and restaurants are closed right now. Um, so, you know, what they're doing is, um, I've got two restaurant clients that have gone and spoken to their landlord about, you know, no rent for at least the next three months to see what happens here. Um, Can't ask. Right. And so far I've got two that have said, yes, you know, I've got one who said, listen, I got to pay my note too. So, you know, we're going to see what happens. But the point is, I think with that one, we're going to talk to the bank with the landlord and, and really show, because it's a pretty successful operation. It's just the rent is a big nut. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are really, really good, good points. Um, so the last thing I wanted to take up with you, and again, it's morbid because it's the possibility that somebody might end up failing and what they're going to have to do to protect themselves. So, well, I don't, again, I'm not expecting any kind of advice from anybody specifically. What I would ask you to do is sort of talk about, I'm assuming that 11 and 13 are the two bankruptcy chapters that apply to businesses more readily. Or yeah, seven I mean, on right. So most people think about a, a seven, which is a personal bankruptcy. A per, it's like a personal chapter 11. There's a chapter 11, which is a business reorganization. And then there's a chapter 13, which is really a wage owner, a wage earner's, uh, bankruptcy. So for businesses, you would be talking if, if in fact, everything went bad, you look at a chapter 11. And generally speaking, the idea of chapter 11 is a circumstance where the business can be reorganized. Um, it's, it's got unsecured creditors who it can do something with, maybe pay them off over time. But basically, the business should be in good shape. And if it was rehabilitated, and paid some kind of a small dividend to unsecured creditors, that there otherwise is equity in the assets and a performing business. And it's just, it's, it's gotten sick. And, you know, we've seen chapter 11 with the airlines where they've worked and they've, they've paid off, you know, some of their unsecured creditors with five, 10, 15, 20 cents on the dollar, but because they otherwise were decent performing businesses and otherwise healthy, they worked. That being said, chapter 11 can also be used for other things. Chapter 11 can be used to get out of a bad lease. It can be used to get out of a bad union agreement. It can be used, so chapter 11 doesn't have to be the death knell for a business. Um, you just gotta make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, some people who are being foreclosed on say, oh, I'm gonna file chapter 11. It's useless, they, they don't get anywhere and ultimately the bank succeeds and, and takes over. Um, only like 15% of chapter 11s are successful, meaning they come out of bankruptcy. But that's really because many people file chapter 11 for the wrong reason. Oh. Chapter 11 for the right reason um, can really be a good financial tool. We, we, years ago, we had a guy in our office who, who did a fair amount of sophisticated chapter 11 work. I remember we once filed one for a supermarket, mostly because to get them out of a bad lease. They had a horrible lease. And what they were able to do is get out of the lease. And they started again. And it, and it worked out just fine. Right. Um, and again, that also varies state by state circumstance by circumstance, but it's something that you should at least, if it's, the, the, the other reason people have difficulty in chapter 11 is they wait too long. And I'm not advocating that people file chapter 11, but if the water is at your chest, you should start talking to somebody about planning, just figuring out what the best thing to do. If the water is at your eyebrows, it, it sometimes it's too late and there's nothing you can do. So, you know, really the best way to survive this, and this is, I've been saying this all week, um, is to be proactive. And like you're doing right now, by getting together with a group of people that are in the trade and talk about it, what can we do? What are some possibilities? Where do we look? You can't run around like, like Chicken Little that the sky is falling. Uh, you're not gonna sit down and just cry. Um, so there are options, right? Um, I'm thinking gonna, about it. Story. So, <laughs> you know, I would, I would talk to your advisors, you know, lawyers, accountants, um, you know, somebody like Andrew, who's in the industry, you know, and kick around some ideas so you know, at least come up with some possibilities. And I wouldn't just go down one road. I would look at a couple of them and see what you think works best for you. Excellent. And then do something. 
Peter, I can't thank you enough. That was good quality insight. It starts the conversation for all these folks, helps them to better understand what they're up against. And, uh, you know, that we're all, we're, all of us are in the same exact boat. We're, you know, we're, we have no revenue, our businesses are closed, and we're just trying to figure out how to make it from day to day. So hopefully this will help those that were able to hear. We'll be posting it as well. And I couldn't be more grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. I'm going to sign off now. All right, Guys, cheers. good luck. Andrew, call me whenever. If anybody has a question, I'm happy to have a follow-up with them. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, that was excellent. Thank you again, Peter. Um, so now we're going to move on to George Kane. George is the our resident direct TV expert. Um, George and I, in preparation for this, talked about a couple of things that can happen. I'm actually going to step back, let George describe what what he's um, knows about what you should be doing and some of the steps and even a bit of service that he's willing to provide to clients right now to help them take advantage. So George, I'm just going to let you do your thing. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wrote some notes down and uh, I'll go through a couple of different things and options and questions that people might have. Um, you know, I, I service about 13,000 uh, bars, restaurants, golf courses, and country clubs around the country. So we've been, you know, quite active with customer service requests uh, in what we'll call a, uh, a situation of downgrading um, programming or taking your programming to full pause. Um, I'll start with some basic questions that people have come to me, you know, what about the payments for NBA, NHL, and MLS, which are in action seasons? Uh, those pro programming packages are typically five payments and someone would have made four of them. At this point, uh, I would not make that fifth payment. AT&T has told me that their policy will be that if you have paid for the entire season, you will get an appropriate refund or credit back on your bill uh, if the season is closed or terminated. For those of you that may have ordered Major League Baseball, if you have that on your bill, I obviously wouldn't pay that portion um, of the bill. Additionally, if you uh, have not made it, if you have made a payment and uh, you're not going to get any future billing for MLB at this point in time. But uh, more importantly, let's talk about uh, programming overall and downgrade options. Uh, I don't think it makes sense for anyone to not downgrade their bill um, at this point in time. Obviously, if you're in a sports bar solution that has ESPN and regional sports networks, there's nothing on those channels of any value at this time anyways, other than uh, reruns. So I, I basically put out four different options for our customers. Uh, one would be to down, if you wanted a full package without ESPN and the sports networks, you could go to what's called commercial choice, which is an $89.99 package. And you only pay for two TVs at $15 a piece for $129.99. Um, the next thing that people are doing is they're saying, look, uh, we're moving into a takeout only type situation. And we, uh, we just want to have local channels on so that we can see what's going on with local news. You can also do that. Uh, that's a commercial basic package, which is $24.99. Uh, you would then pay for each additional outlet, unless of course you could email into DirecTV and I can help you with this and just say, just keep on my primary television. Uh, the most popular thing that is happening is that people are going to what is called pause, where basically you would discontinue all services for DirecTV. You would have no programming on the television uh, a lot of seasonal businesses do do this. If you are a golf course client of mine in Minnesota or the Dakotas or areas where there's cold weather, you're not open all year round. And they go what's on called pause, which is a $9 a month package. Um, obviously at this point in time, uh, call centers are overloaded and uh, staffing has been minimalized. There have been uh, call centers that AT&T has outsourced to, which have had to close completely due to someone within that environment testing positive for COVID-19. Okay. And then of course, call centers have to hip, uh, apply proper spacing. So uh, what I would recommend that most people do is that we use uh, email as the primary method to request these changes. If anyone on this call does want to go to pause, 
I have the proper document needed to do that, to email that into AT&T. If you would write this down, anyone that wants to go on to pause, I can send you that document. Uh, the email address that we're set up for that so that it's all centralized is the word downgrades at pacificconcepts.net, Pacific like, like the ocean, concepts, plural, dot net. If you email that address, I will send you back the, uh, the downgrade document. Um, I'm even willing to fill it out for you if you would like us to do that. Um, in order for me to do that, I would need you to also send me a copy of your bill. That way I would have your restaurant name, your restaurant address, and all of the information that's needed to help you complete that document. And then I'll send that into um, AT&T with uh, you uh, CC'd on that email in order to way to support you as a, as a customer. Um, if you have a dealer that you work with, um, they should also have this document and you can contact them directly, but I'm just trying to be a, an advocate for proper customer support and service in, uh, in uh, obviously times of unknown uh, certainty. I have, I also saw an idea which doesn't relate to DirecTV, but I'm going to put it out there anyways. And if you want to see it in print, uh, I'll be glad to share it with you. A friend of mine shared with me what one of uh, the restaurants in his area was doing. Obviously, as opposed to moving to just a takeout type facility, they actually changed their model to be a takeout and grocery facility. Obviously, they buy food in bulk and wholesale they put together what we'll call a weekend dining package of uncooked food that would be certain amounts of steak, chicken wings, potato, pre-prepped food that then was like a $150 package. Customers can order it and they can go, they call it in, they go and they put it out in their trunk and they drive away with it. You know, obviously sports bars are not necessarily thought of as takeout type facilities. I shared this with one of my local clients and he thought it was a great idea. If anyone wants to see what that presentation looks like and you think that that might be a solution for you to ad hoc improve upon your takeout and provide people with a bundled package of food that they could take home and cook on their own, I'll be glad to send you the, uh, the picture of what that post looked like on social media and then you can decide if that's something that you might wanna use to your benefit. But that was one of the great ideas that I had thought of for people that just takeout may not cover it because so many people are out buying food in bulk. This gives them a solution to get uh, some stuff that would be set up uh, and uh, ready to be made into a variety of meals for, say, a family of four. Actually, brilliant. We were one of the, when we're done with the direct TV conversation, we're going to focus on that. I, I I didn't even think of that. So that's absolutely terrific. Again, we're going to have so all the information George gave you regarding his email address that you can get support on downgrading from. Um, mm. And that idea, whatever link that is, George will provide that, we'll send it out. But you can also reach out to George directly at downgrades at pacificconceptsplural.net. So, yes. but that's, that's great stuff. So uh, when, it, when it comes time to turn back on, I'm presuming it's as simple as a, as a phone call to either you or to DirecTV. Yeah, you can, you'll be able to, when you wanna bring your service back on, uh, the best email, uh, there's an email for that, which is, uh, I'll include in, when you send me this, I'll send you that, it's commercialcustsat at att.com. When anyone sends me a bill or asks me to do something, I'm gonna give them a, kind of like a little template of a workflow plan that they can use not only for making sure that their downgrade happens, but when they want to return to service, we can do that. If anyone does send me a copy of their bill, uh, and I've done some bill audits with Andrew in the past, we often find uh, clients are not being the most efficient in their purchasing. And I will go ahead and let you know, hey, you're in a package that already includes Golf Channel, but you're paying for Golf Channel. so. When we do bring it back on, I'll tell you exactly what to do to make sure you're not wasting any money on your DirecTV bill uh, that you don't have to. Uh, there's a couple packages in there where I often see people might actually, space, actually spend as much as $105 a month for channels that they already get included in other packages. Um, and so I'll be glad to be able to do that. I have obviously, 
outbound sales staff is a non-existent thing uh, in our business right now. So I'm just using my resources to keep everyone uh, engaged in, uh, in helping perform customer support. So that's one of the things I wanted to do here is, you know, we doing all this for free and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring some value to people on this call that uh, they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. George, thank you. I have to tell you, I think that uh, what you gave for information is super relevant. Um, again, we will re-inform everybody. Downgrades at pacificconcepts.net is how you email George for direct support. If you want to include a picture of your bill, that will facilitate him getting a little ahead of things to support you. But in this case, it's just good information. At least now you know you have several options to manage. And uh, thank you. Thank you. For You're very time. welcome. No All problem. Right. So George, we'll, we'll let George do his thing and take off and go back to taking care of his customers. And, thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, stay healthy. Good luck and best wishes. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you in my inbox uh, trying to help everybody out. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. So um, from a going forward perspective, the conversation I wanted to engage in is to talk about a few things. Um, we, don't, we don't seem to have had a lot of people asking questions. It's more about an interest in, in just hearing the conversation. Now, if you're on the YouTube stream, it would be a great time. Um, if you're on our page and you want to access the YouTube so you can do that, if you look in the, in the window surrounding the, the frame, the, the word YouTube is in the window, the lower right-hand corner. If you click that, you go into the stream and you're able to see the stream live and you can ask questions if you have them. So just an, an FYI if that's something that, you, uh, that you're interested in adding a question to. But I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are important right now. Um, you, you know, communication with your staff, vendors, and the community in general is extremely important. So I purposefully did not communicate to anybody prior to this meeting what we were going to do as far as um, freezing everybody's memberships and subscription, because I wanted to see a little bit further down the road. And now that I have a sense for where we are in place, um, we've seen a couple of um, encouraging um, circumstances, certainly uh, in China and Wuhan, they've had um, zero new infections in the last 24 hours and only like 36 or 40 in the last 24 hours nationally in China, which is a great sign that they've flattened the curve. It doesn't mean that the, the disease is beaten, but it might be that we at least have held it off a little bit so that the other efforts that are being done to um, to to combat it can take time to take hold. So if you haven't heard about this, there's a medication that is being used called Favirapir, um, which uh, is being tested in Wuhan and in China and Japan. Um, and it's shown high efficacy to treat the disease. It doesn't preclude it, but it treats it. So if you do show symptoms, this antiviral is a faster route to getting through it. You can go, instead of the average of about 11 days for recovery, it drops it to four, and it drops your communicability, your, your, how, how dangerous your shedding of the disease is, um, and makes it safer for people in the long run. So that's a good sign that they found some results with that. Um, you know, we'll know more with widespread testing finally starting in the United States over the last couple of days. Um, so one of those things where we're learning an awful lot about the disease, the way it moves. Um, I would say to anybody who's sort of tuned into what's happening, that we likely won't see a return to normal for a minimum of 60 days, um, meaning restaurants open in a regular form, et cetera. It, especially if the disease is still growing in infections and we see anything that looks like what happened in Italy. Um, you know, Spain has taken really dramatic steps, draconian steps with their own, their own health industry to, to try to get the costs and the situation under control. So we're seeing a lot of different methodologies across the world. And, Hopefully some folks will find some results and we can, we can all see an end to this nightmare. Um, I would tell you not to think that you were gonna be under siege for the, at least the next 60 days. If it's less, that's probably a good thing. So, so what are you gonna do in the next 60 days? Well, you could be like the guest we were hoping to have, who is uh, Nick Fosberg. Nick is a uh, really well-regarded um, restaurant operator and he has a program he runs with operators called Rest uh, Bar Restaurant Success. And it's a really high quality 
um, emulatable marketing program for social, social advertising, execution, et cetera. And uh, he was going to join us, but within hours of our meeting today, the state of Illinois closed all restaurants, period, end of conversation. No carryout, no modified services, closed. So he's rushing to his restaurants to try to sell off whatever perishable foods he has to do some sort of a come on in and get a ton of discount so we can monetize at least a little bit of that. Uh, if you can still serve, certainly. We published today in the newsletter a five-piece series we did on delivery in general, which might help you as a primer to start considering implementing delivery. Maybe you don't want to use Grubhub or uh, Postmates or, or, or DoorDash. You want to do it yourself. You've got servers in the front of the house, cooks in the back of the house. You can give somebody some hours. It might be worth doing. There are transmission issues. You can require only credit card payments, so your staff's not handling money from anybody. They can wear gloves and masks to protect themselves. They can use disinfectant for their hands. Um, you know, so we're not passing or receiving any kind of viral um, infection. And you know, you can turn your restaurant into that. You will need to communicate to your customers whatever it is you're doing, even if it's to say. We're calling it a day for 60 days till this warms over. If you do that, I saw a great piece, and again, I'll link this, um, about restaurant bonds. And what they basically are is asking your guests to buy a gift certificate for worth $100 and only make it cost them 75. And they would have the value of that increase by some amount every month that we're out. So let's say you've sold a, a $75 gift card that would be worth $100. You can either just give them a $100 credit and thank them for it, or you can escalate the value of it. So if it's worth $75 immediately, and if you don't open for another month, you make it worth $80. If you don't open for another two months, you make it worth $85. And you pay them for the delay in being able to use it. So there's a couple of ways to approach it. If you do certified accounts, gift certificate accounts, it's actually very easy to do. If you're just swiping cards or handwriting them, a little more difficult. But the idea is asking your customers to invest in you, to say, hey, we want to be here when this thing comes back around. If you guys can help us to keep our staff on, on, on term and, and, to, and to keep some semblance of order in our business, we're going to be here when you get back and we're going to reward you. So there's some value in that. That's one step you can take. Um, certainly, as we talked about with George's suggestion, which I think is brilliant is doing home meal packages, not just doing food for carryout, but getting some boxes, lining those boxes with saran and foil, packaging meat and, and vegetable and um, starch, however you want to do it, and do meal packs. You've got carryout containers, you've got other kinds of containers you can buy, and if people are interested, you might just keep yourself busy and be able to stay open, even though they are closing non-essential services, like restaurants. If you're delivering food for bulk consumption, you might be able to stay open. Anything you can do. If your doors are open, you're still in business. And so if your doors are closed, no matter what you say, you're not taking any money in, you're not in business. I can tell you that the Sports TV Guide is not in business. We are absolutely stuck right now, waiting for things to change. And we, if this takes three months for this to resolve, we don't get income for three extra months because we're going to have to credit everybody, which is fine. It's the right thing to do, but we won't have revenue. So we may ask our customers, you know, if you pay us for 15 months, we'll give you 18 months and we will credit them. So these are the kinds of things we're considering about how we give our, our customers a chance to invest in us once things come back and know that we're still going to be here. We'll all work together. So um, I don't know if there have been any questions asked. It doesn't really. Um, oh, so somebody asked about restaurants in Illinois. I'm just going to respond to Pleasant House Pub and tell you that, yes, restaurants in Illinois are required to be closed. As far as I know, by end of business today, I believe 8 p.m. was the window. You may want to check with your local authorities on that, local news, but that is the information I have from Nick Fosberg, who's a restaurant operator in the greater Chicago area who was going to be with us today, but needed to attend to his restaurants. That means he's real. So um, that being said, if there are no other questions, I will say this in closing. First, remember, 
you can always reach out to us. We are going to stay delivering the guide, delivering guidance, insight, news. Um, we're going to work to keep a part of what you're doing and supporting you for as long as we can. We may run more of these sessions as issues start to crop up. You'll be notified about them. We hope you'll feel comfortable joining us. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, Casey Keller just asked, can, you, can we send the email address? And he says it, oh, Casey, it's because it's Pacific concepts, not specific concepts. Pacific like the ocean. Then that should fix that for it. Pacificconcepts.net. Downgrades at Pacificconcepts.net. Uh, but we'll send out a general email. If you got the email to join the session, you'll get the general email and we'll have links and some other information in it as a rundown of this. It'll go out on probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Otherwise, thank you all. I appreciate you joining us. Again, you can reply to any email you've ever received from us. I get them. I will reply back. Any questions, any things you're doing, share strategies. You're not competing with each other right now. You're competing with this disease. So please share. This is the time for us to come together as a community. And I would be proud and happy to participate and facilitate that coming together in some form. I thank you all for being our customers. I thank you all for being patient as we put this together. And we will keep doing this. We really, really, we love you guys and we want to stay with you. So thank you. I'll tell my, my man Justin in the back end that he can end the, end the thing. And to Jeremy Maganelli, Jeremy Maganelli, thank you for your kind words. And we will be here. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.